Well, I'll, like, I'll, tell you how you fix it. I'll tell you how you fix it. I just said it. For the art of seduction, the Kama Sutra. You study it. You attack it just like you attack a fucking calculus problem. Because I've known too many guys I've taught this shit to. Hell, this is how I fucking learned. I learned about sex from a logical standpoint to a practical standpoint. No one. So you saying we got to do like Biloxi Blues when they went got that hooker, you know what I mean, to teach that boy how to fuck. Yeah. Teach him how to, you know, to get his first ass. Yeah. That's what we got to do. I, look, dude, you want to learn how to talk better? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on. Because it's, it's always been something I want to get better at. You can learn all this shit. Some guys have some guys have a some guys can have natural handles, some guys have a better natural shot, but you can always improve your shot. And sex is damn so something you can fucking learn. You could always yeah. learn. Sex, sure. sex is like sure. anything yeah. else, man. Yeah. You can learn, yeah. you can learn that game. You, you you can learn it. You can you can have natural skills, but you can get better at it. Go. I, look, dude, you want to learn how to talk about it? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on. Because it's, it's always been something I want to get better at. Go. I, look, dude, you want to learn how to talk better? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on. Because it's, it's always been something I want to get better at. Go. I, look, dude, you want to learn how to talk better? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on. Because it's, it's always been something I want to get better at. All right. <clears throat> now, you know, my very last video, I started my video with a clip from uh, Goodwill Hunting that emphasized guys, a guy in a bar was trying to present the knowledge, wisdom, and insight from established authors as if it was his own, which of course is known as plagiarism. So I'm going to continue that for about at least the first third of this video. Because people have been bombarding me with questions based on starting, I think, with Monday. I, I put a post on my community page. And then two nights ago, I did an interview with a black male YouTube personality by the name of Gab Talk Media. And I talked about some things. And obviously, some people were listening, particularly some of my black male followers were listening. And they've been sending me emails and Patreon questions asking me. Because whether y'all want to admit it or not, let's be real. Particularly, I hate to generalize, but particularly you black people. Well, I, I, it ain't like nine black people don't like drama. Because obviously people go to movies and watch TV shows for drama. So, there are nine black people who like drama too. You know, a lot of people try to act like they don't like drama. But a lot of people love drama. A lot of people love to go on a YouTube channel if they know some drama's going on. On one hand, I do have a lot of followers, and particularly Patreon subscribers, that on, on one end, they're like, Alan, I, I don't like when you spend too much time talking about your beefs and stuff. I like when you just concentrate on giving me advice. I'm just tired of masturbating. I want to get laid. I just want some good advice. I don't, I don't want to hear about no beefs. So I do have definitely, I, and that's why I separate my YouTube content my free YouTube content from my page. Like, if anybody's a Patreon subscriber, they know my Patreon videos, I rarely have ever touch on any type of beefs or drama with other YouTube personalities or stuff like that. I don't do that in my Patreon. My Patreon videos, no less than 95% of the content on my Patreon exclusive videos is all about advice. It's all about advice. But... Um, my YouTube, I've said multiple times before, I don't mind touching on some degree of beefs and drama and all that type of stuff. So anyway, let's just get to the point. Some people ask me, because I wrote it, it started with me. I wrote a post, I think it was on Monday, where I said I'm tired of people trying to collaborate with me when I, when I know that they have sneaky and or disingenuous intentions sneaky and or disingenuous intentions but I didn't put a name on it because as you know some people I call out by name if I got a harsh criticism like you know I've, I've called out alpha male strategies on different stuff I've called out Mumia Obsidian Ali on different stuff um, 
trying to think of other people who I've mentioned. Yad from London, I've called out by name on different stuff. Sasha Day Game, I've called out before by name. And probably at least a half a dozen, or if not a dozen or more people. You know, when I'm angry enough, I call people out by name. Then other times, I'll allude to people. Allude to people. But I won't actually say the name. And that's what I did earlier this week. But, and even on Gab, when I was on Gab two nights ago, I talked about this particular person, but I didn't mention them by name. I know, even though people in the chat room were like, oh, we know you're talking about this person. So obviously I've gotten a bunch of emails and even some people in my comment section are like, Alan, are you beefing with your fraternity brother? I don't know if I would call it beefing. Beefing is when you have public back and forths. So I wouldn't categorize what's going on with me and my fraternity brother, Kevin Samuels, as true beefing because we haven't had any type of public back and forth. But since people have been asking me, I'm going to give full disclosure. Yeah. He and I, I'll put it mildly, he and I are not on the best of terms right now. I'll just leave it at that status. He and I are not on the best of terms. I, again, I wouldn't go as far as to just flat out call it beefing, but he and I are not on the best of terms. To give at least a couple background, backstory details of why it started with, it's been basically two things that contributed to why I now have at least, if it might be a temporary sour relationship, it might be an indefinite. The future will hold. Because there's some people I've fallen out with and then made up with them again. But the obvious best example of that would be Steve Dean Williams. If anybody know the history of me and Steve Dean Williams, we've had probably like, eh. I want to say a minimum of six major falling outs where we we didn't speak to each other for weeks, months, even years. I think our longest falling out was for about three and a half years. We didn't speak to each other. But then we became cool again. Now, I haven't spoken to him in a while, although I'm not beefing with him, but I haven't spoken to Steve in a long time. I want to say at least maybe three or four months. Um, but I wouldn't consider myself as beefing with him, but I haven't spoken to him in a long time. Um, but he's probably no one person I can think of in the, in the manosphere, more specifically the black manosphere, that I've kind of had this roller coaster relationship with, where we'd be cool, fall out, be cool, fall out, be cool, fall out. Um, no, here's here's a brief thing with Kevin. I'm not going to get too lengthy or too detailed with it, but it started with, if you remember, I did a video where I talked about my four archetypes of men which is total alpha males, alpha males with a few beta traits, beta males with a few alpha traits, and total beta males. And now, what most people may not know, I think most people should know, but what some may not know, see, there's some terms that I use both in my books, in my videos, that are what I would call general, generic, general manosphere terms. For example, good girls versus sluts. I have no ownership over those terms. Those are general society terms and more specifically general manosphere terms. Alpha males versus beta males. I have no ownership over those specific terms. Alpha and beta those are used in society in general and specifically in the manosphere. Nice guys and assholes. Um, the term womanizers. The term gentlemen. I can name a host of other terms. So there's some terminology, there's some concepts, some philosophy, some terminology that I would say is general. Is generalized. Then I have other stuff, though, that's unique to me. That's unique to me in a sense of unique in one of two ways, either unique in the sense that I actually created it and invented it. Like it was net, that term, concept, philosophy, slogan was never used before ever in life. Or 
I may not specifically created it or invented it, but I was the first one to popularize it. To popularize it. Now, going back to Kevin, I was talking about my four archetypes of men. Alpha males, total, what I call total alpha males, alpha males with beta traits, beta males with alpha traits, or total beta males. Now, two of those are, again, what I would call general terms, which would be just simply alpha males and beta males. I have no ownership over those terms. But those two hybrid terms, I came up with those. Those are not general manosphere terms. I created those two archetypes in the mid-1990s. Nobody had used the term alpha male with beta traits or beta male with alpha traits before me. Nobody. And if anybody tries to say, tell you different, they lying. Nobody used those two terms before me. I created, originated those two terms, those hybrid terms. The alpha male with a few beta traits and, and beta males with a few alpha traits. Those are my terms. Those are my copyrighted terms. I created those terms. And um, so to touch on Kevin, when I did that video, I saw in the comment section, he said something to the effect of great minds think alike. I was just talking about these four archetypes in one of my recent videos. I don't know if it was a YouTube video or a Patreon video, but he said, I was just talking about these four archetypes. And I wrote them privately. I basically said, hey, man, you know, those two hybrid archetypes are mine. Those are mine. So if you talked about them, I would hope you gave me my proper credit attribution because those are mine. <laughs> and he did say, he replied and said, oh yeah, Alan, I always give you your proper credit attribution. Anytime I borrow some of your talking points or concepts or terminology, I always give you your proper credit attribution. So I left it alone. I said, okay, cool. Then on Super Bowl Sunday, I was having a little get together with my brother, sister-in-law, girlfriend for the Super Bowl. And I happened to be on YouTube for at least a half hour, if not a little longer. And I saw Kevin doing a live stream. And I didn't catch the whole thing. I think the whole thing was pretty lengthy. It might have been two hours, might have even been three hours. I only caught about maybe about a 25-minute stretch of it. But in this 25-minute stretch, I heard him talking about that he does one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face coaching sessions, which I was the first black male dating coach in the world to do those. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. And anybody who tries to say different is lying. But I'll say this more specifically. I was the first black male dating coach to do one-on-one face-to-face -on -face coaching sessions that had a heavy-duty emphasis on interpersonal communication skills, verbal communication skills. Now, if you're talking about some other area, like maybe like, I don't know, for example, health and fitness, obviously you got personal trainers who've done one-on-one -on -one sessions with their clients that emphasize health and fitness. So there's, there's a number of different areas. I wrote an article on the Negro Manosphere about that. You know, someday I, I compared in this article on the Negro Manosphere, I compared dating coaching to being a physician. That's the analogy I use. It's like you have general physicians. Most people know they have what's known as a family physician or a general physician. And then there's specialized physicians. So like I have a general physician, but like today, I have a doctor's appointment today, matter of fact. In about an hour, hour and a half from now, I have a doctor's appointment. I have a doctor that specifically checks on my kidneys. See, she's a specialist. Her specialty is stuff, to, ailments to do with kidneys. She would be called a specialist. You know, you have people who are heart specialists, skin specialists, i.e. dermatologists, eye specialists, eye specialists, i.e. Uh, ophthalmologists. Um, what else? Foot specialist. That would be a podiatrist. And so on and so on. Brain specialist. N neurosurgeon or neurologist, whatever. You know, so there's some people who are general physicians, and then there's some people who have specialties. Specialties. So I would say this. 
I don't know if I can say with full conviction that I was the first dating coach and more specifically the first black male dating coach to do one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching sessions period. But I'm pretty much certain that I was the first one to do them with the emphasis on improving your conversation skills. So I'm listening to Kevin and he's talking about not only does he now do one-on-one face-to-face -face coaching sessions, but he's emphasizing interpersonal communication skills, verbal communication skills. If anybody knows Kevin's background, man, when he first got on YouTube, all he talked about was clothing and cologne. That's all he talked about. I used to watch some, a lot of his videos. All he talked about was clothing and cologne. And then, even more specifically, speaking of Gab, who I had the discussion with a couple nights ago, I remember Gab interviewed Kevin. And asked him specifically. He said, Kevin, are you a dating coach? Do you consider yourself a dating coach? Kevin said, no. He said, no. I actually, when people come to me for dating advice, I actually refer them to Alan Roger Curry or Ron Wills. He said, my emphasis is on image consulting. Your image, your style, basically stuff to do with how a man dresses the clothing he wears, the jewelry he wears, the cologne he wears, his grooming. That was Kevin's main area of expertise. But I hear him on this Super Bowl live stream basically sounding like me. No, at minimum, he was sounding like he was a dating coach. He wasn't sounding like an image consultant. He was giving the type of advice a dating coach would give. And when he start, start talking about he puts emphasis on verbal communication skills, I'm just putting it blunt. I was like, oh, this nigga trying to be me now. And I wrote him. I wrote him. I wrote, I sent him an email. I basically told him, I said, dude, I ain't cool with this. Because Kevin is someone who's tried to repeatedly collaborate with me. He's always tried to, ever since he's been on YouTube, he sent me emails and text messages looking to collaborate with me. As have a number of people. See, here's what you got to understand, man. And I'm just going to break it down. I'm just going to get some stuff off my chest, man. And I've done this, I think, at least two or three times before. So this won't be necessarily the first time. But when it comes to stuff under this category, I'm, I'm going to get some stuff. I don't know Curry about to turn into, you know who, Rambo and rant and get some stuff off my chest. So the, the concept of collaborating, there's some people who have genuine, sincere intentions to collaborate with you, but then there's some people who have devious, sneaky, underhanded, disingenuous intentions. I'm just going to keep it real. And I, I've dealt with both. I've dealt with people who fell into both categories. See, a lot of you young people might not be familiar with this term, but I'm going I'm to introduce some term that some people, most older people know what this term. There's a term called a Johnny come lately. Johnny come lately. What is a Johnny come? I first use the analogy of sports. I think anybody who's a, a reasonable sports fan has heard the term bandwagon fan. Bandwagon fan. What is a bandwagon fan? Like, you take me, for example. I've been a Chicago Bulls fan since I first started paying attention to professional basketball because I lived in the Chicago area. So I've been a Bulls fan and a Chicago Bears fan since I was, like, in elementary school. Definitely no later than middle school. I was both a Bulls fan, a Bears fan, Cubs and Sox fan. Bulls had one shit. And I was a fan of the Bulls. Bears had won shit. Well, they had won some old NFL titles. But they hadn't won a Super Bowl title. White Sox and Cubs had won shit. No World Series. Or at least not in the modern era. So I was fans of those teams before, even when they had were struggling and had their losing seasons. But then you got other fans who didn't become Bulls fans until Michael Jordan got there. Didn't become Bears fans until after Mike Dicker led them to a Super Bowl. Didn't become White Sox and Cubs fans until after, you know, they had made a nice run in the playoffs and or won the World Series. 
That's what's called a bandwagon fan. If you were never a fan of a team when they were sorry and losing, but all of a sudden they get some really good players, like say you never paid attention to Golden State Warriors, but then once Steph Curry got on there and once they start winning, all of a sudden you, you got all this Golden State Warrior paraphernalia in your house, that means you're a bandwagon fan. That's a bandwagon fan. Well, the business equivalent somewhat of being a bandwagon fan is being a Johnny-come-lately. A Johnny-come-lately. I'll use simply my industry. See, when I became a dating coach, for the most part, there was no such thing as a dating coach. <laughs> Real talk. When I became a dating coach, there was really no such thing as a dating coach. Most people didn't even know what a dating coach was until the movie Hitch came out in 2005. And that's real talk. That's the first time the term dating coach really became truly mainstream was when the movie Hitch came out with Will Smith. Before that movie came out, nobody knew what a fucking dating coach was. Now, pickup artists had been out for a few years before. I would say pick up, the term pickup artist had been around since at least the 1990s, if not even possibly the 1980s. So I had heard of the term pickup artist as early as the 1990s, but as far as specifically dating coach, that didn't really become truly popular until about 2005 when the movie Hitch came out. Like I gave an example on... Um, Gab showed the other night. And I've often compared myself to this, this guy, even though he's in a totally different industry. He's passed away now. But some of you may remember Robert Atkins. Now, Robert Atkins, he came up with what's known as the, the Atkins Revolutionary Diet, which pretty much centered around a low-carb diet. If, if I'm not saying, he didn't create or invent the low-carb diet, but he was without question the first person to popularize it. He was the first one to popularize it. He, he wrote his first edition of the Atkins Diet in 1969. He, but do you know his book did not become a, be, a New York Times bestselling book until the mid-1990s? You're talking about 25 years later. It took him 25 years before his book became a New York Times bestseller. And what happened? That happened around, I think, 1994, 1995. Guess what happened after this book became this, this you know, million dollar seller? Everybody started trying to copy him. Everybody started trying to copy him. Whereas early on in his career, do you know other doctors and other nutrition experts, they called him crazy. They actually called him crazy for promoting a low carb diet. People said it was unhealthy and crazy to promote an, a, a low carb diet. But next thing you know, once this shit, he, they, people saw he was making money from his book. They was like, well, shit, I need to write a low-carb diet book. And, you know, he had, to, he had to file at least two or three lawsuits, copyright infringement. Because there's some people who tried to basically copy his diet damn near word for word, concept for concept. And he sued them and won. I was a dating coach when I wasn't even really making no money off the shit. And most people know that. Like, I had a full-time job between 2008 and summer 2012. I was doing dating coaching on the side. And a lot of people used to tease me and criticize me about that. They would be like, oh, Alan, yeah, you, you call yourself a dating coach, but you ain't really making no money. Because if you was really making money, you wouldn't be have, you have to have a full-time job. It wasn't hardly anybody that was calling themselves a dating coach. Now, I know somebody going to say, well, what about Tariq Nasheed? Tariq Nasheed never referred to himself as a dating coach. He did use a similar term, but it wasn't dating coach. He used to call himself a game advisor. A game advisor. That was his title he gave to himself. He would call himself a game advisor. But as far as I know, Tariq Nasheed didn't do one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching, though. Not to my knowledge. Now, he can correct me if I'm wrong, or one of his fans can correct me if I'm wrong, but he didn't do no one-on-one -on -one face. He might have done 
email consultations with his clients. He might have done even some Skype and telephone consultations, but he wasn't doing no one-on-one face-to-face coaching. Where he was flying out and meeting with, with clients in the way I've done. Like, I fly to cities to work with clients. I was the first black male dating coach who was doing that, who was flying to cities to work with clients one-on-one. Nobody else. I would even say there weren't even many non-black dating coaches doing that, let alone black dating coaches. I was one of the first dating coaches who was going as far as to fly to another city to work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, and they pay me for it. But I know when the turning point happened, it happened around somewhere around 2017, 2018. See, because that's when I first really got in my groove, really technically the latter part of 2016. Financially, that's when I first started hitting my groove. I started making high five figures and then starting with the latter part of 2017 and early part of 2018, I started making six figures. So a lot of people said, damn, that's a lucrative career. You can make some money being a dating coach. I didn't know you could make high five figures or six figures being a dating coach like Alan Roger Curry is. So what did that create? Johnny come latelys. Johnny come latelys. I put my concepts on paper for Mo One back in 1990. 30 years ago. A lot of the stuff you hear other game advice, dating coaches, pickup artists talking about on YouTube and other places. Dude, a lot of the stuff that other people talk about, I'm going to just put it out there, man. They got it from me, man. I ain't going to say everything, but I, percentage-wise, I would say at least 40 to 50% of the stuff that, that other people be talking about, I either created it and invented it or I was the one who popularized it. In, on a national scale, if not an international scale. Man, you got all these people, you know, because they, they saw that I, I could make good money being a dating coach now. And, and, and it ain't like I'm trying to prevent people, other people from being a dating coach if they got the credibility and qualifications to be one. Now, I know some people will say that, hey, Alan, with all due respect, man, sometimes it seems like you want to be the only dating coach that people go to for dating advice. Like, you don't really want any competition. No, I'm going to kill that, that mythical perception right now. I don't have a problem with other men becoming dating coaches, whether they black men, white men, Hispanic men. Asian men, Middle Eastern men. I don't have any. I don't have problems with other men becoming dating coaches. Again, for the upteen time, here's what I have a problem. Let's say you're a guy. I don't know, 35 years old, 35, 40, 45 years old, and number one, you've had a lot of what you feel are unique experiences with women that no one else you feel in the manosphere or in society in general has yet to talk about. You have had some unique experiences with women that you feel that no other book you've read, no other person on, on, on YouTube or who had an audio podcast program or whatever, shared experiences that were just like yours. Okay? And because of that, you say, I think there's a void that needs to be filled by me. Even more importantly, you have other people telling you that. Instead of you telling yourself that, you got other people telling you that. Like, in other words, you got your friends, acquaintances, family members saying, let's say your name is John. People are telling you, John, man, you've you've had a lot of unique experiences with women that not too many guys have had. You should write a book about that. 
You should write a book about that. And then start offering coaching and consultation sessions. See, that's what happened with me. I didn't just randomly just one day up and say, hey, I want to write a book and I want to be a dating coach and blah, blah, blah. No, there was a demand for my knowledge, wisdom, and insight. Started, it started with my brother, as most people know my backstory. The first person would be my own older brother. He was When he witnessed me being more one with women, he realized that I was using an approach that 99% of men were not using, which was in the mid, mid 80s. No man was just going up to women and just straightforwardly telling them, I want to fuck you. No man had the balls to do that. No man had the balls to do that. At least none that I knew personally. Wasn't nobody on the campus of Indiana University going up to women like that. I was pretty much the only guy at Indiana University that was going up to women in within the first five minutes of the first conversation telling them straight up, I'm trying to fuck. Most guys was either trying to get women drunk to fuck them or lying to them and giving them the impression they wanted a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship or some other unethical method. But nobody was in a really bold, balls-out way just going up to women saying, hey, I ain't trying to be your boyfriend or none of that shit. I'm just trying to fuck you. So my brother was like, man, you on to something. And other friends and other fraternity brothers over the next few years said the same thing. They was like, Alan, you on to something, man. You, you need to turn this into a book. And even then, I didn't turn mine into a book immediately. My brother started telling me to turn my one into a book back in 1986. I didn't actually officially turn it into an ebook available on the internet until May of 1999. So you're talking about 13 years later. I first wrote the outline of my Mo One book, the initial outline, in October of 1990. And then starting with summer 1995, I wrote these like 25, 30-page pamphlets that I kept tweaking and updating and expanding, tweaking, updating, and expanding. But anyway, going back to competition, so number one, if you're a guy who's had some unique experiences with women that very few, if any other men have had, you got some type of approach or technique you use to, to attract and, and get women in bed that very few of other men have, and you ain't heard nobody else talking about it, then my attitude is, by all means, you should pursue a career as a professional dating coach. By all means, a book author and a dating coach. I think the two should go hand in hand. I've said this before, book author and dating coach. If you're a dating coach, but you ain't got no books, you ain't gonna never have no full credibility with me. I'm gonna just tell you that straight up. You might have credibility with other people. You ain't going to never have no credibility with me. If you calling yourself a dating coach or you're basically marketing yourself as some variation of a dating coach, but you ain't got at least one book for me, I can't speak for nobody, but for me, I ain't, I ain't going to never give you no full respect because to me, you just hustling. You're just talking shit. You 99% chance you just repeat other shit that people have already talked about. You ain't got nothing original. Because if you had some truly original, you would want to come out with a book. Like me. If you truly felt like your stuff was original, you would want to, you would be highly motivated to come out with a book. I don't respect no dating coach fully respect. Again, if I had to put in percentage, you might get 35% of my respect. You might get as much as 50% of my respect. But 90 or 100%. You ain't going to never get like 90 to 100% of my respect if you call yourself a dating coach and you ain't got at least one book. And more specifically, your book doesn't have something unique and original in it. So again, if somebody else wants to be a dating coach and they've had, number one, some unique experiences with women that has caused them, of course, to have some unique knowledge, unique wisdom, unique insight on how to deal with women and they first put that in book form. And then after putting it in book form, they then begin to promote email consultations, Skype and telephone consultations, one-on-one face-to-face -on -face coaching. Then I ain't gonna have no problem with you. I ain't gonna have no problem with you. What I only have a problem with is, is plain and simply is people who weren't even thinking about being a dating coach before and even more so, they were criticizing dating coach. I can name at least two 
people, if not more, who are now dating coaches that started out criticizing dating coaches. Alpha male strategies. Alpha male strategies started off criticizing. If you paid attention to him around like December of 2017, he used to harshly criticize dating coaches. Then less than two months later, he began marketing himself as a dating coach. Mumi Upson in LA now markets himself as a dating coach. He used to harshly criticize dating coaches, including myself. After we fell out in summer 2017, he used to criticize the profession of dating coaching. Now he's marketing himself as one. How am I supposed to respect someone as a dating coach if they started out criticizing the profession? I'm sorry, man. Some of y'all other guys might follow them dudes, man. I ain't gonna never have 100% respect for somebody who started off criticizing dating coaches, but then turned around and tried to make money off of the profession. That's bullshit to me. Straight up. That's bullshit to me. I don't care what anybody say. That's bullshit to me. But yeah, the number of people I have problems with calling themselves dating coaches it's people, again, plain and simply, it's people, from what I know about them, they don't have any experiences that are truly unique. They're not talking about anything that has not already been talked about dozens of times, if not hundreds of times. Like literally 80 to 90% of the advice they're given is basically them just repeating, regurgitating and in many cases, verbally plagiarizing somebody else who's more established than them, who got a book out. Them the guys I ain't feeling. So it ain't that I just don't want a dating coach and other people to become dating coaches. I don't want anybody calling becoming a dating coach and essentially just trying to rip my shit off. Or if not my shit, whoever else is more established, maybe like Ron Wills or somebody. I see once the inter internet really be start becoming popular, I hit the ground running. I hit the ground running. My first ebook made, was made available on the internet in May of 1999. That's around the time the internet really first started getting going. So I've been around as long as the internet has been around. What's other guys' excuse? Why is it taking some guys till 2000? in 16, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 to announce that they're a dating coach when the internet been around for like 20 plus years. What do you really have that's unique to share that ain't nobody shared in any way, shape or form? Really? At this point in the game, what can any guy possibly offer that hasn't been already repeated at nozzle? Really? I mean, I'm just going to keep shit like extra duty real. What at this point can you really come up with? Really, what advice can you really present that hasn't already been presented in somebody else's book, somebody else's audio podcast program series, somebody else's video podcast program series? What can you really present that's truly going to be unique? See, when I first came out with Mo One, man, wasn't nobody, wasn't nobody else around Mo One? Wasn't nobody else talking dirty to women in the first five minutes of, the, of their very first conversation with a woman? When I first started being Mo One, man, I was raising eyebrows. People was tripping off of me. Women would tell me. They was like, I ain't never had a guy approach, approach me like you before. See, if, if my stuff, if my approach was already common knowledge, then when I approach women, women would have been like, oh, you like the 90th guy this year that done used that approach with me. That's what they would have said. They would have been like, oh, damn, you, another one of you guys again? Damn, I, had, I, done had, I don't know how many guys approach me using the same approach as you. Man, pretty much every woman I've used the mobile one approach with, they were like, damn, I ain't never had no guy approach me like this. I ain't never had no guy approach me like this. So that's my whole thoughts on the whole competition competition piece. If you unique, if you got something truly unique and original to offer, I encourage you to become a dating coach. Again, to me, how it should go, it doesn't always go like this with guys, but this is how it should go. First thing you should come out with is a book first. That's what I did. 
See, I did not become a dating coach, then a book author. Like, that's basically what Alpha Male Strategies did. He started giving advice on video first, and then later he came out with a book. I came out with my book first in 1999. I came out with my book first. Then I started doing dating coaching. My book, I wanted to have my book out first to establish my credibility, establish the fact that my advice was unique and original. Then I turned to dating coaching. But nowadays, in the last two, three, four years, you got you got guys calling themselves dating coaches. They, they ain't even, they don't have not one ebook out, let alone a paperback. Not one ebook out. And again, to me, that's bullshit. But I got two things. Number one, don't be trying to copy my shit. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to start, I'm going to call you out on my channel. And that's the minimum thing I'm going to do. I'm going to call you out if I hear any word you copy my shit. Because nobody has blessings to copy my shit. And see, this takes me to this whole thing about collaboration. See, this is the sneaky way some people try to do. Some people, when they want to copy you, what they'll first do is try to become friends with you. I explained this to Gab the other night. So if you already, I'm repeating this if you already heard my interview with Gab. But see, some people, what they do is they'll try to befriend you and they'll try to collaborate with you. But it's really a sneaky way to try to basically absorb your knowledge, absorb your wisdom, absorb your insight so that they can repeat it and regurgitate it to their followers. And then it's like, say, they got a client that might say, well, damn, you sound just like Alan Roger Curry. What's the first thing they're going to say? Oh, me and Alan are cool. Me and Alan are cool. I have his blessings to talk about his concepts, use his terminology, use his philosophies, use his slogans and catchphrases. We cool. I'll tell you, if I had to call out a minimum of one name, and I, I'm only calling him out because I've called him out before on this. First person tried to do that, use that technique with me was Sasha Day Game. Sasha Day Game tried to use that technique. He first tried to become cool with me, tried to become friends with me. You know, we did collaborate with these direct dating summits he did. Then the next thing I know, he was doing Skype consultation with people using a lot of my terminology, using a lot of my concepts, using a lot of my archetypes, using a lot of my flight. And then when people would ask him, like, hey, man, isn't that Alan Roger Curry? So he would say, oh, man, Alan are cool. I got his blessings. No, he didn't. I never gave him my blessings to profit off of my shit. I ain't gave nobody that, that type of blessing. Nobody. Not one person. Not one person has that the, the blessings from me to make money off of my shit. Mark that down. Nobody. So if you out there and you're a client of mine or a potential client of mine and you've heard other people, like you've done an email consultation or a Skype and telephone consultation or one-on-one, -on -one, and you can tell that people are using stuff from my books, let me know because I'm going to sue the fuck out of them. My coaching is trademarked with the USPTO. That means all the particulars of my one-on-one face-to-face -face coaching is trademarked, which means I can take you to court, and I will. Watch the movie The Founder, man. I mentioned that on my community post. Watch the movie The Founder. There's a few movies that have been done about unethical or somewhat deceitful or disingenuous collaborations. I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head. I know The Founder, Wall Street with Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. Well, y'all know some in real life. Like, I'll give you a couple of real life. I've pointed these out before. Look at Bill Gates and uh, Stephen Jobs. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, of course, is the one who started Apple, and Bill Gates is the one who started Microsoft. Now, for those of you who don't know, who might be too young to know about the tension between them, Bill Gates, what he did was he became cool with Steve Jobs. He was basically started out as a protege 
of Steve Jobs, but then he went on to basically, in a sneaky manner, just essentially stole his shit. Yes. In case you don't know that, Bill Gates, that's all his Microsoft stuff was basically stuff he stole from Steve Jobs. The only difference is, here was the main difference in simple terms. Steve Jobs, he wanted his software to only be included in computers, personal computers that he manufactured himself. So he only wanted Apple software to be on Apple computers. Whereas Bill Gates' attitude was, well, why should it be limited to Apple computers? This technology should be on any should be able to be used on any computer, whether it's a Dell computer, IBM computer, Hewlett Packard computer. So that's what motivated him to create Microsoft. He and, and basically his Microsoft technology was Steve Jobs' computer software technology, just made in a form where any computer could use it. Where any computer could use it. And oh, they had a they didn't speak for a number of years. They got cool right before Steve Jobs' death. They kind of became cool again. But oh man, watch the movies. There's been a, two or three movies made about their relationship. I remember I watched a couple of those movies, man. Steve Jobs, man, I thought he was gonna kill Bill Gates, dude. Real talk. He was he was pissed. He went the fuck off on Bill Gates. He told him straight to face. He said, man, you're stealing my shit. The founder. Now, I'll say this about Ray Kroc. He wasn't totally dishonest or deceptive when he collaborated with the McDonald's brothers. He actually tried to help them make more money off of what... See, and I think I've talked about this before, and I'm going to briefly talk about it again. See, if you don't know, here's the deal, man. All the fast food companies you see now, like Burger King, Wendy's, White Castle, In-N-Out Burger, all of them owe a debt of gratitude to the McDonald's brothers. Nobody was doing fast food before the McDonald's brothers. Nobody. Everybody had just, you know, pretty much traditional restaurants. Nobody was doing what's known technically as fast food delivery, where you could order food and get your food like within five minutes or less. Nobody was doing that before the McDonald's brothers. McDonald's brothers created that business model. They created that business model. And what happened was Ray Kroc, who at the time was a shake machine salesman, he came into McDonald's to sell them a shake machine and he saw their business model. He was like, shit, this is innovative as hell. He was like, shit, y'all sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> he saw the, the money potential even before the McDonald's brothers themselves saw. He was basically like, y'all sitting on a gold mine with this shit. So the first thing he suggested is that they franchise, which they ultimately did. Well, Croc ultimately did it. But he said, hey, man, you need to duplicate this in the form of franchises. And the McDonald's brothers were like, oh, we tried that once or twice. And people start selling stuff that wasn't even on our menu, like ribs and pork chops. And we just want to sell hamburgers and cheeseburgers and french fries. And Ray Craig was like, well, then you put together a contract where you specifically make it so that they can only sell the products and services you want them to. But they was like, nah, we don't want to do it. So he took it upon himself to start creating franchises for the McDonald's brothers. And those franchises start becoming profitable. But he didn't feel like they was giving him a, enough of a cut. They was giving him like a real small percentage the prophets, and he came to him first and said, hey, I think I should be getting paid more for what I, I've helped you guys a lot. I've helped, you know, you guys create franchises. And my dad's brother's like, basically like, no. So he did something clever. He started buying the buildings that the McDonald's franchises were housed in. And he started charging the McDonald's brothers for a lease to lease the actual buildings. The McDonald's brothers own the concept of fast food delivery, 
but Ray Kroc owned the buildings that they were in. And he started making so much money then without getting the long story. If you were, I pretty much then told you the whole movie, but the movie's still worth watching. The founder is, if you're in the business, that's a movie worth watching. But he came to them and basically bought them out. Now he did something nice though. He gave them a blank check. He said, he gave each of McDonald's brothers a blank check and said, how much do you think it is worth for me to buy McDonald's from you? I think one brother put down 3 million and the other put down, I think, 5 million. And I think he ended up just giving them both 5 million each. And then he went on to become a multi-billionaire on something that he didn't even invent himself. Happens in the entertainment industry all the time, man. Again, I mentioned this before, Prince. That's why Prince fell over Warner Brothers. There's a lot of people in this society who don't have any talent themselves, don't have any original ideas themselves, don't have any creativity themselves, but they know how to make money off of other people who have talent, creativity, original ideas. They find a way to make money off of other people. And see, one of the reasons why a lot of people try to collaborate with me, if they, I mentioned Sasha Day game, he openly admitted it as far back as 2010. I remember we were in London together. And uh, I was talking to Sasha, and Sasha, he just, first he just kind of looked at me, and then he said, Alan Roger Curry, damn you, damn you, damn you. I'm jealous of you. And I said, why are you jealous of me? He said, because of your mold one brand. And I said, oh, really? What, what about my Mo One brand makes you, you, you jealous and envious? He said, because as you know, when it comes to verbal game, there's mainly two schools of thought when it comes to verbal game. There's direct verbal game and indirect verbal game. And so I said, what he basically went on to say, which honestly, for the most part, is true. He said, Alan, let's be real. He said, you pretty much cornered the market when it comes to direct verbal game advice. Now, when it comes to indirect verbal game advice, there's a number of different personalities, a number of different brands that are almost equal on an equal level. But he said, when it comes to direct verbal game, the words, simply the words Mo One, you've gotten it to a point where Mo One is associated with direct verbal game. He basically went on to say, if anybody, if another dating coach tries to come out and, and promote themselves as a direct verbal game coach, Everybody going to, the first thing everybody going to say is, oh, you're copying off of Allen. You're copying off of Allen. You're just trying to be like Allen. And that has happened to a lot of people. Mo One is pretty much almost synonymous with direct verbal game. It's synonymous. There's no other person's brand who is synonymous with indirect verbal game the way Mo One is with direct verbal game. When you think of indirect verbal game, you don't immediately think of just one PUA or one dating coach. But when you think of direct verbal game, everybody, unless they living on another planet, is going to think of Alan Roger Curry. 